Hey guys, this is Shaft and welcome back. Actually, it's been a couple of days since the last uh, time you saw this casted. I know we promised you a five part series and we're definitely going to take care of that. But we were running a little bit over time of those first three games. We're back though. It is going to be myself, uh, SG, Matt C. How you doing, Matt? Doing well. How about you? Doing well. How's uh, Sensory Gaming? Uh, we actually have a bronze, silver, gold tournament on Saturday. All right. That's going to be pretty fun. What's the date of that, just uh, so people know? That is February 23rd. It will be at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, which would be 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Awesome, awesome. Appreciate that, man. And also with us is our professional commentator, White Wing. How are you, Joel? I'm doing fairly well. Quite well, actually. Glad to hear that, man. Glad to hear that. Well, today we're actually bringing to you another game uh, from StarCraft 2 Strategy.com. Uh, the player is actually uh, one you saw earlier. I believe it's game number two. It is going to be the blue Protoss here, Stews. And he's in the top left hand corner of Entombed Valley. Now, on the bottom right hand corner, we have someone announcing YOLO. Uh, and uh, that it does stand for you only live once. He is the red Zerg player on the bottom right. Very dumb expression, but to each their own, I suppose. And he is, in fact, a Grandmaster Zerg. Indeed, sir. Indeed. So um, this is a game Stu's is very, very uh, happy um, about. He thinks he played very, very well. So we'll see exactly what he's... Uh, got planned in store for this zerg and what the zerg is going to do to respond uh what are your thoughts here we actually got a, a pool before hatch coming for the zerg um i mean that's standard on this match in this matchup you kind of need to do that if you don't want to because uh if he sends a scouting probe out because mm -hmm. you can get your hatch reblocked if you try to hatch first Indeed. and if they open with a forge fast uh, a forge first build before nexus mm -hmm. um you can they can get cannon you can get cannon rushed and there's almost no way to stop a proper cannon rush if you uh, open hatch first. Absolutely, Stu's not even interested in blocking that hatchery. It seems. All yeah. right, so he's going Nexus first here. Both players going with that economic build like you were discussing. He is coming over here to uh, get in position for this forge as well. But uh, overall, uh, what I was asking about are, you know, it's Ensumed Valley. Protoss gets a pretty easy third. So we're definitely going to see this go into a macro game in all likelihood. But what are your thoughts as far as strategies in this cross map positions? Uh, well, first of all, this is a very, very good map for Protoss out of all the maps in the map pool. Mm -hmm. um, there's very little airspace between bases. It's easy to defend the three bases, which makes Mutalisks a little bit less viable. Right. Um, it's easy to bounce back and forth once you've taken out the rocks on the ramp mm -hmm. between your third and your natural. Um, and there's two ramps going up, both of which can be easily walled off, which makes defending against Roach or Hydra pressure um, a lot easier. Right. And there's not a lot of space um, in your bases to put, say, a Nidus Worm or something. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, uh, it's very easy to defend, especially with sentries um, on this map. Indeed. Oh, hit back by accident there, guys. Sorry about that. Um, which basically means that Protoss just generally wants to take a third base, not because all in attacks on two bases are weak, necessarily, mm -hmm. but because generally three base plays are a bit stronger. All right. And we've definitely got that cyber core coming down now as well. So once we see the cyber core finish up, we can actually expect to see any kind of aggression, or I'm sorry, not aggression, uh, tech from Stu's, and that will allow him to put aggression on later in the game if he so chooses. Interesting to note, though, he's only taken one gas at this point. Is this fairly normal? Uh. It's not really the most standard of builds. Generally, uh, players take two gases after their si uh, after their gateway. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not really that far off. It suggests that he wants to focus more on getting probes out and getting some um, important uh, structures down, maybe a heavier gateway count, um, rather than getting early upgrades. Gotcha. Now, we do have a uh, stalker being chronoed out. Uh, this is going to point to that early aggression we were talking about. What are your thoughts on the Chrono there? Uh, he wants to get it out very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. He wants to put on some very early pressure. You can see that he totally walled himself in mm -hmm. so that his so that his um, units can be out on the map without having to worry about dying to a counterattack. Right. 
Um, he's got the two cannons so that one can take down the rock while the other defends. Um, mm -hmm. And that uh, if a heavy road aggression comes when he doesn't have sentries, because his, his gas count is going to be low. Okay. So he can't really afford sentries. So the second cannon is also to help defend without sentries. Understood. Now, he's got the two cannons there. Is he really worried about aggression, or is he just trying to stay super safe? Um, he's not necessarily worried about aggression, but with skipping the sentry uh, mm -hmm. by having not having the gas count for it, means that you have to have something, because if roaches do show up, you just instantly lose. Gotcha. Now we do have an overlord being sacrificed to the Protoss gods. YOLO, at least for that overlord. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's just going ahead and just to put some pressure on this third. He wants to get out of there now, because if he lose, gets surrounded with those lings, those units are just going to die. Right, and actually it looks like the lings may indeed at least get the zealot. It looks like the stalker is going to get away. Yeah. Okay, so, um... We've got a Robo about three quarters of the way through, um, about three quarters of the way through Warp Gate as well. Do you think we're going to see an Immortal Sentry? Uh, the fact that he's just now taking a second gas means that it's all he can't definitely can't afford it. Mm -hmm. It looks to me like he wants to take a very fast third base, um, which is why he's been working on this rock so long. He's why he's delayed the minerals um, so that he can have afford the third base and then get a gateway wall up at the ramp on the third. Okay. He just wants to take a super super fast third, and then he's gonna and then he's gonna start pumping out um, immortals and sentries and other units after that to uh, to defend that base. Gotcha. Now we do have a macro hatch, a roach one, and an evolution chamber coming out for Yolo. Now he is on three bases uh, with a fairly good drone count, so it looks like we're gonna be expecting nothing but an army uh, here. Uh, in the future for YOLO for quite some time. He's probably expecting Stu's to do some kind of timing attack, but with this Ling aggression here, he is seeing that, uh, you know, there's actually a third base coming, so he can kind of put that idea to rest, maybe eke out a couple extra drones. Oh, absolutely. He can, he just, unless he's going to be going all in on right now, which mm -hmm. is very difficult to do on this map. Right. He's, he's just going to throw down that macro hatch. He's just going to pump a drone. He's going to take a fourth base. And there's the fourth going down, yep. Yeah. And he's just going to macro, macro, macro and get himself set up for a late game. Absolutely. Now, we've got a uh, plus one carapace coming, um, but he is temporarily supply blocked. He's got six overlords on the way, though, so uh, it's not going to be something he has to worry about for very long. No, um, he's he's set up nice and well. Um, Stud is taking this third base within view of the overlord that was over it. Mm -hmm. Tells him flat out there's just absolutely no aggression going to come. He's going to get up to his perfect drone count. He's going to tech rapidly. He's going to be in a fantastic position to, um, to hold off any pressure by the time pressure is actually capable of uh, coming forth. Now, he's sitting at 71 drones right now. What would you say the perfect drone count is? Um, generally in the mid game, you want to go up a little bit higher than that if you can, and you're not worried about pressure, because then you'll stop, bank up some minerals for a little while, it'll help your tech a little, go a little bit faster, and then you'll convert the excess drones into spines and spore crawlers. Gotcha, well he's got 13 on the way, so I think he was listening to you there. Now, it's interesting to note, there are actually three evolution chambers, uh, all working on upgrades here. This, uh, is a little unusual. Yeah, I'm not really... It's it's very unusual. I'm not exactly sure what that signifies. Um, unless he's going to be doing some, like, roach, roach Ling and just really wants to have good upgrades. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of cute because it can allow you to do heavy roach attacks, and then it allows your transition to, to say, Ultralisks or Broodlords to be very powerful because they'll also have great upgrades. Right, and he's um, actually finishing up uh, Pathogen Glands now and getting that hive, so I think he's trying to do that exactly the way you described. Yeah. The, um... The upgrades don't benefit the infested Terrans anymore. Mm -hmm. So unless he's going to be making, so unless he's going to consistently make roaches um, or hydralisks, and that this uh, this little roach force we see here isn't just for defense, mm -hmm. um, getting the range upgrade doesn't make much sense. Understood. So he's probably so he's, he probably wants to have his options open mm -hmm. um, for a longer game and make whatever unit he feels appropriate at whatever point in time. Gotcha. Um, so right now we've actually got the spire coming as well as ten spine crawlers. So with all this being said, what's broodlords? Um, if you were in vertical positions and not cross positions, broodlords mm -hmm. would almost always be the correct choice. Okay. Um, I think broodlords are generally a better choice than ultralisks on this map. Um, but this map it's in particular has so much open space in the middle that it makes broodlord pushing a little bit harder. Okay. Um, so it might be Ultralisks, especially since he's also getting um, the melee upgrades. Fair but, enough. I mean, with with this wall that he has here, it's probably going to be Broodlords. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about Stu's then. He's working on Colossi, Charge, Thermal Lance. He's getting his plus two armor, his plus uh, plus three attack. Wow. Um, so the the charge that's more going to be for harassment with warp prisms you think or is he going to be switching into something more zealot heavy i don't think so i actually think he's probably going to be going into a big three base attack to try to kill before broodlord's ready okay um charge um at this timing mm -hmm. um is gotten more common recently it tends to be very good for um for this type of attack where the opponent is stocking up um supply is saving up on instead of maxing out for a little bit um, it gives the Zealot some nice beefy power, whereas they normally wouldn't have it. Um, okay. But it's not generally, doesn't really usually increase the strength of the harass too much. Okay, understood. So yeah, we actually haven't seen any kind of warp prism drops lately. However, there, oh okay, a um, little bit of a interest here. There's a Templar archive on the way. Yep. Um... The fact that he's taking this fourth base indicates that um, if he's going to do the three base attack, it's not he doesn't want it to be all in. I've mm -hmm. seen creator, I've seen create players like Creator do this a bunch. Okay. Um, well, they'll take the fourth base, but then they'll go to do the attack anyway if they smell a little bit of weakness. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, his opponent at the time is basically maxed out and doesn't have any of the brood lords out, although he's got a bunch of corruptors. So unless he sacrifices some supply, he can't really make very many. Yeah, it almost seems like the corruptors are against. Uh, um, anytime you see a three base, fast three base, um, Protoss, you kind of know Colossus are coming. So I'm wondering if the corruptors are strictly there for the Colossus right now, and he just plans to remax into Broodlords. Oh, well, there he goes, killing off his roaches. So uh, he, they were for Broodlords. He just had too much supply. Okay. And Stu's is going to hit right as these Broodlords are morphing. Ooh, race against the clock they here. He's going to go into the spy crawl. I don't know if he can break through the spy crawl wall before those brood lords are, are, are in position. Indeed. It looks like the spines might have bought him just enough time. Looks like Stu's is going to be forced to retreat. There's a little bit of a fungal going on here. Stalkers do get caught up. However, the brood lords are moving in over the spine crawlers. Uh, it looks like there's going to be an engagement. There's not much ground force here for y uh, YOLO. And the stalkers are able to get underneath the brood lords. Go ahead, sniping them off. The ground forces finally arrive for YOLO. But is it going to be enough? The stalkers are doing a lot of damage. All the brood lords have been eliminated. And the Colossi are going down. Ooh. Always feels painful as when uh for a Zerg to watch that. Yeah, I mean that was kind of it wasn't your ideal composition, but it was getting pretty damn close. And to to be that close and have it stripped away from you, Yellow has to be feeling a little rough. But he is twenty six supply behind and he's getting a good round on the stalkers. If he can target off a Colossi so he can keep his other units alive long enough to kill the stalkers, he will be in a fairly good position for a counterattack onto that fourth base. He finally got rid of that last Colossus. Yeah, so if he can uh, get this next round of units uh, in here on the ground forces of the Protoss, he may be able to hold off, but it's going to be a close situation here. Yeah, that Immortal, with uh, it's got 17, it's had 17 hit points left. It racks up to 16 kills right now. <laughs> Absolutely, and we have a 20-kill Executor Archon, and uh, he's having some fun with those drones as well. They are going to go ahead and target down the third base now of Yellow, so Stu's doing a lot of damage here. However, Yellow being smart and keeping his units uh, back, uh, well, the Broodlord's actually a little bit vulnerable there. Uh, they are targeting down some Stalkers. Looks like he's going to try to force the uh, Protoss back. However, Stu's very smartly trying to lure the Broodlords over open ground so the Stalkers can take advantage of their vulnerability. Oh, and it looks like they're going to catch the Broodlords. This is his perfect position. He goes ahead, gets the Broodlord. So even though there's a fungal on the Stalkers and the Zealots can't get in position, he is in a great situation against this small clump of roaches. Absolutely. Um, I've, I've, got a, I've got a quick emergency. I'll be right back, man. Oh, absolutely. No problem. Hopefully your house isn't catching on fire like last time. No, uh, hopefully not. <laughs> YOLO uh, <laughs> dropping the well played. So, uh, yeah, Matt, what are your thoughts on uh, on the end of that game there? Well, I think really, in my opinion, what turned that fight around as I was watching it uh -huh. is when you saw, one, he brought the warp prism with him just in case those Colossus fell, most mm -hmm. likely to bring out the units. Now, what really happened, though, in the fight, um, he did, you know, tease a little bit with the infestors they did catch some of them 
but when the main Zerg army went to push back, you'll watch it. Um, he goes and blinks. He does this nice blink right underneath the Broodlords, mm -hmm. pushing them back, and then he takes in uh, micro straight onto the Roaches. Even though he knows that his last Colossus is going to fall, he does tank down that main Roach army, and that allows him to keep pushing. Gotcha. So right here, he engages the spy car wall. Mm -hmm. He's got he's got everything. He's got the observer going over, and we have this army down here by the base, and he's going to bring these infestors up. Now he kills he killed about you know four spine crawlers there. They're going to get the fungal off, but he's only going to lose like one stalker there. He does have that warp prison there, and right here he catches those infestors immediately, pushes them back, blinks right underneath those brood lords, right there. One, two, three, four, and that abs that cleans up most of that Zerg army. The corruptors are going to come in. But it's a little too late right now because he's already wiped out the infestors and the broodlords. Right. I almost feel like if he had tried warping the broodlords over here at the third, uh, even though he would have lost the fourth, obviously, he would have been able to rally and then just rebuild it later on. And being a Zerg, you know, rebuilding your drone count is nowhere near as hard as it is for the other races. Definitely. And honestly, that blink, I think that blink is the reason he was able to win this. And right here, when the Zerglings go to get this around, he keeps the Colossus in the same spot. But look at this, though. Instead of worrying about those two corruptors, mm -hmm. he's going to focus on the roaches because he knows if the roaches concave on him, he's going to lose that army. Indeed. And actually, we do have a lot better upgrades for the stalkers than the roaches. So that's leaning itself to this uh, victory here for Stu's as well. I can definitely see why he was so happy to defeat this Grandmaster player who... Uh, you know, made some good decisions, but ultimately, you know, choosing to put the Broodlords at the fourth rather than the third when he saw that timing, that right there would be the death of him. In. Yeah. And that, uh, that really is, the, that is, you know, that is the end game right there. When he mm -hmm. warps in the final round of Stalkers, you know, it doesn't look like there's much a Zerg player can do here. Yeah, if not for that warp in, though, these and Broodlords that, wouldn't have died. Yeah. Right there. He caught two of those before the morph was complete. Mm-hmm. Or right as it completed. Yeah. Man, Sorry that, about that. No problem, dude. Your house okay? Oh, it's, well, it had nothing related to my house. It's not, nothing major. It turned <laughs> out not to be an emergency after all. Yeah, in case anyone's wondering, the last time we cast it, actually, um, there was a uh, lightning storm or something. I don't know exactly no, what... No, no, no. no, no it's, it's, it's even sillier than that. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, electrical company was outside doing some work that morning on, uh, the, electri on the box outside. Mm -hmm. All right? The, uh, the worker didn't close the box properly when he was done. So later... In the middle of a rainstorm, apparently a raccoon climbed inside the box and chewed on some of the cables. <laughs> and that caused electric sparks in the middle of a cast, and we obviously had to reschedule. It basically sums up, you know, what exactly happened there. But, uh, hey guys, with that funny story and such an awesome game from Stu's, we are going to move right on into game number five. And in case you're wondering, this does include the top European player, in the world, according to the WCS. Stefano! See you there. <laughs> 